Um, I'm Sudhira Wanguri, and uh, I'm the product manager for Language AI here in Cloud AI. I'd like to welcome here and thank you for taking the time to uh, talk about the latest developments in Translate and Natural Language AI. Uh, fun fact, we couldn't put AutoML uh, in there until, uh, until this morning because of yesterday's announcements. So that's uh, what we're going to be spending most of our session uh, on. Why are we here today? So a quick agenda on uh, what I'll be covering as part of today's session. Uh, so the first part, I'm going to talk about uh, natural language and cloud natural language and cloud translation. <coughs> and dive deeper and give you an overview of AutoML natural language and AutoML translate. Following that, we have two customer case studies, two customer use cases on both AutoML natural language and AutoML translate. We have guest speakers from Qualtrics and we localize one of the largest localization vendors in the US. And uh, towards the end of the session, I'll also provide some useful resources. So finally, we can talk about AutoML translation and AutoML natural language. We've um, we have spent months working on these uh, new products and new capabilities in uh, cloud translation and cloud uh, natural language. Let's do a quick deep dive. Cloud translation is one, was one of our first forays into AI and uh, APIs, and this has been a well-loved API since 2011. We support hundreds of uh, languages from Afrikaans to Zulu, and uh, used in combinations, we support translations between thousands of language pairs. And with neural machine translation announced last year, Google has been a leader in this field. Uh, you can translate text, and in case you do not um, know what the text uh, language is, we also provide the capability to detect the language of uh, the input text as part of the trans Cloud Translate API, and I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, with it. Now, with uh, our latest uh, products that we've launched, we want to make it easier for every business to solve their problems using AI. Typically, some of the uh, problems in AI, AI is, is hard. It requires a lot of machine learning expertise. It can be complex, time intensive. It requires data science expertise to do hyperparameter tuning, machine learning expertise to evaluate and understand what precision is, what recall is. And finally, you'll have to spend time and effort to maintain those models, deploy those models, and then keep them updated as you scale. We, with Cloud AutoML, we want to enable citizen data scientists to customize and build your own machine learning models in four simple steps. And what uh, these simple steps are upload your training data, create your machine learning model by training it, and within a matter of three to four hours, you can get a working machine learning model customized to your company's use case, and the quality is expected to be much better than some of the generic APIs or generic translation models or natural language models that you've seen before. So how does tra AutoML translate work? Imagine you have a um, custom domain use case. You have um, techni technical manuals or um, possibly uh, sports-related use cases or oil and gas documents that need to be translated. You could use Google's Cloud Translation API, but if you have high-quality training data, high-quality tr human-translated language pairs that you can provide a sample data into AutoML, what we do is with as, as little uh, as 10 examples or 100 uh, examples of uh, play, uh, sorry, translated language pairs, you can train an AutoML translate model. And the typical training um, model training time is about three to four hours. So within a matter of hours, you can get a translated uh, model that can work really well for technical manuals or any custom uh, use case that is that has a lot of jargon or industry-specific jargon that a regular Translate API may not be able to catch. I can walk you into some of the uh, example use cases where custom or domain translation becomes really important. 
I'll use the error message here as an example. The device driver is now working. So you have the summary of this is the driver is not working. Now, if I were to generate a translation of this, uh, this string or this sentence without providing any context to a translate API, this may mean a golf club driver is not working. In another context, it may mean that the driver is on a strike and the driver is not working. And finally, the use case that we actually want to point. Okay. In another context, and the context that we actually want to point our machine learning model to, the device driver in a technical context, the software driver, is not working. I can point you to two more examples and more real-world examples where one of our customers we localize who's going to come on stage shortly to talk about uh, their use cases. We train two machine learning models, one for restaurant reviews and the other was an educational use case. So we localized, built an, uh, a, ma a machine translated model, a custom translate model, uh, an English to German uh, model for classifying restaurant reviews. And the English to Spanish model on uh, Blackboard is uh, corresponding to educational or legal use cases. And here's a quick sneak peek into what the UI looks like. As you can see, sentence pairs are uploaded as training data. A model has been trained. So this is a GIF that would keep rolling so you'd be able to see it if it's too tough to catch at first shot. So we provide a comparison as well. So these are the uploaded sentence pairs that are provided as training data. The blue score, that is uh, the, the level of accuracy, the bilingual um, uh, language evaluation on our study, which is used to indicate how good of a model uh, is the training output. And once you go to the predict step, as you can see, that's a restaurant review. The service was nice and friendly, is, is the same, but the drink prices were lifted versus the drink, drink prices are upscale. Now, upscale is a better, a nu more nuanced translate, translation that applies to a restaurant review. There's another example that uh, can be seen in the predict uh, stage. We highly recommend it versus we can only recommend this. So these are some of the nuances that a custom machine translated model will be able to catch provided enough training data. Let me walk you through another example, which is a Spanish to English model, and this has been trained on Blackboard. Again, as you can see, you are able to view the blue score, and that's the predict step. This was an educational use case. So the training data corresponds to a lot of um, educational jargon. And in the predict stage, as you can see, graders versus qualifiers. So the qualifiers, the, Goog the custom Google, uh, the custom model versus the Google machine learning model, uh, we see that qualifiers is not very um, specific to an educational use case, but graders is a better translation. With that, I would like to invite we localize Olga and uh, Alex, who's who's been one of our alpha customers. Hi, everyone. Hi everyone. So I'm Olga Rigavaya. I manage uh, language services at WeLocalize. And uh, managing machine translation at WeLocalize is one of my responsibilities. And Alex here. And I'm Alex Januszewski. I'm senior manager of machine translation and NLP at WeLocalize. OK, so uh, we'll continue. And I lost the clicker. I swear it was just here. <laughs> 
So we'll continue on the subject of customization and how important it is for our industry. Maybe a couple of words about our company. We're the fourth large, largest uh, global content services provider in America and seventh in the world. You can see some stats about our company. And uh, using machine translation is essential for our industry because we're after two things. We are after translator efficiency and we are after being able to provide raw machine translation services, customized machine translation services for our customers. So here are the industries that we service and we trained AutoML Translate models for all of these industries, but we're gonna talk about examples from just two of the industries. So education, as we said earlier, look the, at the examples that we have. We have moderator FAQ converted from frequently asked questions by the moderator. Obviously, that's a much easier content to consume. We have created mashups, which is our customer proprietary terminology. And we have deadlines for national submissions, which is a corrected mistranslation. Now, next one would be translation for open table. Now, this one, we're not sure if we're going to be post-editing it or we're not going to be post-editing it. So, to make this decision, basically, we don't know yet. Are we post-editing or not? But what we do know is that we want the most accurate translation possible. So, what we have here, regional and national products. Is it accurate or not? We actually prefer supra-regional products. Now, the next one, the service was very pleasant, nice, and courteous. Extremely pleasant, gives you a much better uh, sense of sentiment. And the next one, we can only recommend this, and we will definitely be back soon, compared to highly recommend, and again, you capture much better sentiment. Uh, drink prices were lifted, compared to drink prices were upscale. Again, you have accuracy of translation here. And the next two sentences are just not accurate. Happy to return compared to gladly again. And highly recommend compared to can only recommend. Here again, you're, you're basically dealing with the actual mistranslation. Okay, so uh, Olga actually spoke about very specific sentences. Um, what I wanted to talk about is how we would actually implement this more in a programmatic way, right? Because often, we don't have the luxury of looking at individual sentences and we need to forecast an entire program. So the way we do this is um, one of the numerous auto scoring algorithms, the one that we use primarily for forecasting a program and forecasting kind of time to market and discounts is called P distance, which stands for post editing distance. And what you see here on the chart is three languages for a client in the IT domain and you can see that the what you're going for is the lowest number. So post-edit distance means the number of changes at a character level to get from the machine translation output to what you consider your human, your gold output, right? So the idea is the less changes you have to make as a translator, the more productive you are, right? The faster you are. The faster you are, the faster you can translate and therefore the faster the product can get to market. That's one important thing. Also, the faster you are and the more productive you are, the more of a discount you can give to a localization service provider like us, which we in turn can pass on to the client, right? So what you're looking at here for is the lower the number, the better. What's really, really encouraging here are a couple of things. Number one, so the dark red you can see that's uh, Google AutoML translation. That's the lowest number. So that's the winner and the best P distance for the three languages presented, right? And you could see for French that that number compared to second place, the difference is 3%, right? Um, in the case of Russian, it's also 3%. So um, you'll see another example where e it's even more drastic. So one takeaway is Google AutoML translation wins. What's also curious is second place is Google Cloud Translation. So Google Cloud Translation is already very good and Google AutoML Translation is even better and has those lexical choices that Olga mentioned. The last thing that I wanna point out is you have six contenders here, but you'll see that for Russian, there are only four contenders. 
That's actually not a mistake, that's on purpose. And the reason for that is two of the contenders, two of the competitors that we looked at simply didn't even have this language to score in the first place. So that's kind of another reason why we found Google AutoML translation to be so powerful, the rich coverage of languages that some other competitors simply don't have at all. So let's, took, let's take a look at another case. So this is also IT domain for another client, another Fortune 1000 um, client. And so what we often do is we look at auto scoring, which is very cheap and efficient to do, but we also measure human evaluation. So we'll take, a, we'll take some sentences as a sample and we'll have a human being look at them and adjudicate them based on a level from one to five, right? Scale of one to five with one as the worst, five as the best, right? And the idea here is we wanna see to what degree this lines up with the patterns that we're seeing from auto scoring, right? And here again, you see a similar situation. So what we're looking for is usability on a scale from one to five. Usability means to what degree are the sentences understandable and actionable. And there are two use cases for this, for this. One is you might want to do just raw machine translation as Olga was mentioning with open table. So it's gonna come out with raw machine translation, that's it. It's not gonna be post edited at all. So we need to figure out how good this is because no one's gonna touch it. The other scenario is post editing. So we're going to post edit this up to a human level and again, the better the initial quality is, the less we have to post edit, the more productive we are, and the more discounts we can give, right? So what we have here is a table that shows 100 sentences that were evaluated in these various competitors, right? On a scale from one to five, it's an aggregate score. And what you'll see across the board for all of the languages is that Google AutoML came in first. Sorry, so in this case, um, five, with here, number one means that it, it finished in first place, meaning it got the most fives. So, sorry about that. So, we, it was on a scale from one to five, but, but these are basically ranked, you know, number one, Google AutoML translation is the best, and number six here is actually the worst performer. So, sorry, sorry if that was confusing. Um, so, the things that I wanna mention here is that you see that Google AutoML translation came in, was the best, in all of the languages. And you see uh, languages here that span Romance languages, like Spanish and French, which are relatively easy grammatically, to kind of mid-tier languages, more complicated grammatically, like German and Russian. And finally, Asian languages like Korean and Simplified Chinese, which are particularly difficult and, and where we've seen the greatest improvements on neural. And again, the other thing here is that Google Cloud Translation um, came in, of the six languages, it came in number two twice and number three, three three times. So again, we kind of see this picture of Google Cloud is very good to start out with, but when we train it, Google AutoML translation clearly comes out on top. And this actually dovetails very well, again, with the post-editing distance for these six languages. So here, the gray bar, again, we're looking for lower is better right, because less edits that you have to do. So the gray bar, the one that's lowest for everything, is again, Google AutoML translation. And you could see when you look at second place, often second place is green, which is Google Cloud translation, and the other ones are far, far worse, right? And you could see that the difference between the gray and the green is already fairly significant. So again, we're seeing this picture of very, very good quality when we train um, AutoML translation, and as Sudira said, we can basically get these models back in three, four hours and start benchmarking and rolling them out into production immediately. And maybe I could say a couple of words about the edit distance. As I said earlier, if in case of open table, we don't know if we're going to be post-editing or not going to be post-editing, in case of Blackboard, for instance, we do know for a fact that we are going to be post-editing, and edit distance is our core decision-making factor when we know how we're going to be negotiating with our client and how we're uh, going to be negotiating with our translators. So basically knowing what we get for edit distance is the way that we're basically going to be, that's the way we're going to be structuring our business conversations on both sides of the equation. This is why it's the key metric for us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex and Olga. Moving on, 
I'd like to take you into a product walkthrough of Cloud Natural Language API and then dive deeper into AutoML Natural Language, one of our newest product offerings. Cloud Natural Language API that's currently in GA currently supports four different features. Entity extraction, as you, you'd like to extract some keywords or phrases uh, from, uh, from a text passage. Um, sentiment analysis, how positive or negatively um, biased a, a certain article is, what's the sentiment of, uh, say, a user review. Analyze syntax, say you'd like to get into the linguistic details or the parts of speech of a certain text passage, uh, what's a noun, what's an adjective, um, so on and so forth. And finally, classifying content. Our current uh, content classification API available within Cloud Natural Language API supports 700 different categories and subcategories. And this is based on a predefined taxonomy. This taxonomy, um, this uh, content classification API is trained on massive volumes of Google data and it's highly suitable for various categories. But what we've had our customers ask us is, to customize these categories to their own use cases. Imagine an oil and gas customer or a healthcare customer or certain, again, technical data where these classifications or labels or categories are very custom to uh, an enterprise use case. User reviews, customer feedback may need to be classified to let's say the um, there is a flight survey um, experience that um, that needs to be categorized into ambience and uh, service or food so on and so forth so these categories may be very relevant and specific to a certain enterprise use cases a certain domain and there may be use cases where you can squeeze more accuracy out of the content classification api so that's one of the primary factors for us uh, diving deeper into AutoML natural language. And the first feature that we've enabled as part of AutoML natural language is custom content classification. Now, how does this work? Again, similar to AutoML translation, customers can come in to AutoML with some amount of training data. We require at least 10, label, 10 examples per label for, um, as a minimum requirement for, uh, for running the model and about 100 examples for each label. That's very little amount of training data that needs to be provided to train an AutoML natural language content classification model. Now, once this classifier is trained, and again, this is going to only take about four to five hours of training on some amount of training data, and boom, you get your custom classifier that is that's that works specif specifically on your data. Your data is not shared with Google or with uh, any other customer um, uh, model or data, and the model can start to scale as needed, assume your model gets very popular. If you start seeing a um, huge amount of requests, the model can scale to uh, adapt to your custom demands. And if you have further amount of training data, you can always retrain your model and then the custom classifier scales to adapt to your needs and uh, your own labels and categories. So how could you use AutoMLL? Here's three examples. You could predict the tags of a stack overflow question, say, this is a very technical uh, example that the, the custom content classifier or regular classifier APIs may not be able to catch. You could predict which um, news house a certain article is from. And healthcare, assume doctor's notes or patient's uh, notes need to be an analyzed. Again, 90% of enterprise data is unstructured. So given an input of healthcare specific terms, you could provide the model some training data to tag symptoms to certain diseases and uh, the AutoML classifier can start predicting uh, based on this custom use case. Behind the scenes, what do we do? Again, to if you, if you know throughout this experience, we did not talk about hyperparameter tuning, we did not talk about anything other than just training your data, clicking on train, looking at evaluation metrics, if, you, uh, if the model's good, great. Then if the model isn't, you provide more training data or tweak the model to your specific use case and then you run predictions. Behind the scenes, 
we mimic a data scientist, what a data scientist would do to generate the best model for your use case. We kick off multiple pipelines, multiple Google, uh, Google models, and we surface the best model for that specific customer data set. It's, uh, it's abstracted from the customer which, uh, which parameters need to be tuned, which model to be used. We, we do all the heavy lifting behind the scenes, and you see the best model that uh, gives you the highest precision recall for your use case. We've seen a lot of customer excitement for AutoML. We've been in alpha for a while, and we've had a lot of customers, one of whom is going to talk uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a brief uh, while. Uh, Qualtrics, but <coughs> we've seen Meredith, uh, specifically on national language, Hearst, um, Singapore Airlines. There's a lot of customers within the news segment and various other domains that have found significant use cases within AutoML national language and um, within Translate as well. We see we localize and uh, plenty of other customers. With that, I would love to go into some of the details uh, that Qualtrics can talk about. Uh, they've used uh, AutoML natural language for optimizing their survey responses and love for Milin to explain how they've done that. Thanks, Adira. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Milin. I head product for Qualtrics Surveys, you know, our uh, survey fl it's a flagship product. And um, what I'll do is I'll uh, talk about the problem that uh, the, the survey research industry is facing. Uh, we'll talk about the solution, and then we'll look at, you know, under the hood, uh, how we implemented that solution. We'll also show you some cool demos. Um, so with that, uh, what, what, what's, the, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Um, so, you know, at, at Caltrics, we get every year, you know, we, we send out more than 200 million plus surveys. You know, we have billions of survey responses. And um, the problem is that, you know, and this is just across the survey research industry. In, in fact, you would see better numbers here, but uh, you know, 85% or more of surveys are just not completed. And I'm sure you can all relate to that, you know, who loves taking surveys. And there's a reason why that's the case. More often than not, the questions that people ask in surveys are just plain wrong. They are not relevant questions. Uh, they are not worded correctly. And often that means that it results in invalid data, first of all, You'd be lucky if people would complete the survey. And even if they do, uh, you know, the famous saying, right, garbage in, garbage out. So if you ask a wrong question, you are going to get a wrong answer. And uh, that is, that's a huge problem. It's uh, resulting in, you know, invalid data would mean wrong business decisions, which is costing the survey research industry as much as $4 billion in losses every year. More importantly, wrong business decisions means, you know, to quote a phrase, it's sinking the ship for a lot of businesses. Now, um, what's the solution for this? Well, uh, the solution is pretty simple. Uh, just create better surveys. Make sure that you ask the right questions. If you are designing a survey, make sure that the questions you ask are very relevant, are very, uh, you know, uh, at, at Caltrex you call it predictive questioning, and I'll show you, uh, you know, uh, a demo of that. And if you're a survey taker, let's make sure that you are having an engaging experience. Let's make sure, you know, I think uh, Sudhira mentioned about post-flight surveys, right? Let's make sure that if you're getting off a flight and you get a survey, and if you say that, look, I'm upset um, uh, that the flight was messy, let's not ask a question like, on a scale of one to five, how happy are you? you clearly, you're upset. You, you better ask a more relevant question to that. So, um, you, know, uh, you know, a quick show of hands. How many of you, let's say in the last one year, have had a a bad time taking a flight. So pretty much all of us, we all had the stories of having a you know, poor flight experience sometime or the other. The thing is, you probably don't know, but a lot of flight companies, um, you know, a lot of them are our customers, they do take it seriously, and they do want to do something about it. They have armies of people who are working on customer service, working on trying to fix these problems. Uh, but the problem is, uh, you know, they're doing all the right things, they're trying to get feedback, but they're not asking the right questions. So while they have armies of people on standby to fix these issues, they're not able to find out what is the issue that you, know, you, as you walk out of the flight, had with the flight you just took. So here, uh, you know, what I'll do is I'll show you a quick demo where we took a 
a regular flight survey, we, we, it'll be very familiar. You know, you all must have, you know, from your favorite flight that you got off, you got a survey, and you answered questions. Uh, we will show you an example of what happens when we start introducing AI, when we start using AutoML into a Qualtrics flight survey. So with that, this is a video, and let me just go ahead and play it. Hold on, sorry. Hold on. You just got off your flight, and we asked you a question, a survey question, how was your flight? And let's say you, if the flight was uneventful, you have nothing special to talk about, you just say that it was okay. And in this, in this example, what will happen is we know that you do not have any specific intent, you do not have any specific topic that you want to talk about, so we will just um, you know, end the survey right there. Um, however, contrast that with if I say something like, how was your flight? If I say, if I'm really upset, I'm really upset because I lost my bag. So I'll say, you lost my bag. Now in this case, we know that you're, you're not happy, and secondly, we also thank the, uh, the uh, auto ML APIs know what specifically you're not happy about. So we will, A, acknowledge that uh, the person is uh, not happy. This comes from the NL APIs that we are able to understand the sentiment in real time, but more importantly, we are also able to understand what is that specific topic that the customer has in mind, and we ask a more pointed, a more contextual question around the specific topic. In this case, it's about baggage. So we ask them a more specific question around, all right, tell me more about the baggage piece. So as you can see here, uh, by engaging with the customer on a more contextual, at a more contextual level, it feels much more human-like, much more conversational, and that has resulted in a higher engagement with customers and surveys, and therefore a higher completion rate and a higher data quality. All right, so with that, um, hold on a second. Trying to move to the next slide here. Oh, I guess I need to. You know, it's all the tab up there, so I'm not sure how you get there. Probably want to escape and go to the tab. Oh, there you go. All right. <laughs> you know, we should ask a survey about this experience. Um, could you go back to the slide? There you go. All right. So. Go back a few slides. So, uh, you know, actually, that's a good segue to now. So this was the, the experience that uh, we could enable, where, as you can see, it was much more engaging. We were, you know, much more to the point. The questions that we asked were much more relevant. And let's take a look under the hood on how we made that happen. So, um, you know, I think as Sadira mentioned on how the technology works, what we did was we took a, f uh, a few of these uh, responses for one of our customers, you know, when people give feedback after a flight, and we started labeling them, right? We labeled them with a certain purpose in mind. So, you know, this company did have a team working on flight cleanliness. So if somebody said that the flights were, um, you know, the flights were messy or flights were not clean, we labeled it as a cleanliness issue. If somebody said that the flights, you know, uh, talked about their, uh, that the prices were too expensive or the flight was unaffordable and so on, we label that as a pricing issue because there is a team uh, with our, that a customer has who works on pricing. So we, we, firstly, we, you know, we, we label a bunch of responses. After that, we trained the model on those very responses. Uh, and it did a pretty good job. It had a pretty high precision and recall. And we also tested that by, by you know, checking how good it is in predicting what is the issue, what is the category when somebody types a response. 
So, you know, in this case, somebody, you know, this is a response where someone said, you're asking me to pay for even the smallest things, which were at one point free in a flight. Well, AutoML did a pretty good job of saying, well, this is a pricing issue. So in a real survey, it would mean that this would get routed to the pricing department in the flight company. And now, once this was done, we used call tricks to, uh, 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 to, to help make a great survey. So for example, we have this product expert review. What it does is it will be able to predict what is the right question you, if you're creating a survey, what's the right question you should be asking, and guides you on how to ask that question. So it used the results of AutoML to guide people, the survey creator, on what's the right question to ask. We also have functionality to have logic. So we said, all right, look, if this customer starts talking, first of all, if he's unhappy, then ask a certain set of questions. If he's happy, ask a different set of questions. If they're talking about, in this case, service, then ask questions around how to improve your service. So we made sure that the logic in the survey was super contextual, and the net net of it was the demo you just saw, where you know, in a, in a flight-like survey, it's a much more, it's a very different experience than what you would regularly experience. It's much more contextual, much a shorter uh, survey, much more to the point. Um, let me wrap it up with one last example, and this time I'm hoping the video comes out right. Um, so let's play this video. So this is an example, uh, you know, before I play the video, of an e-commerce uh, 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 site. So you know, we also have a lot of e-commerce companies, and you know what happens with e-commerce? We we all been there. We all go to an e-commerce site. We all go and shop, but we don't buy just right there, right? We we browse. We take our time. We may ask, you know, a significant other. Eventually, we go back and we decide on one particular product to buy. And what e-commerce companies are trying to do is how can they make that experience better for their customers? So how can they um, make sure that you know, the, the products they show, the selection is right? How can they make sure that the checkout experience is very seamless, right? So they want to get feedback, and they use us to get that feedback. But let's see how, even there, we can ask the right questions when you try to collect feedback. So for example, if somebody's saying that, look, um, I wasn't able to find the right selection of products, let's ask feedback about that. Let's not ask some f questions which are totally irrelevant to what they're trying to give feedback on. So in this example, um, this is a, a survey that you would have with call tricks. Uh, you know, and here they ask, how was your in-store experience? And it seems like they're not happy. And we ask them, why were you not happy? Right? And, um, they said the service was great, but the checkout was a poor experience. So now we use that, I mean, thanks to the AutoML topics, we ask a much more pointed question. We ask them, all right, tell me more about checkout. And uh, not service, not product selection, we get straight to the point, ask them specifically about that issue, and the, the survey is short, it's sweet, it's to the point, and net-net, it's a much more engaging experience, and you get um, the answers which you know, can help you make decisions. So, yep, that's how we use AutoML and Qualtrics to create engaging service. Thank you. Thanks, Belen. It is confusing. <laughs> I can imagine why. So, we saw how AutoML Natural Language empowered Qualtrics to build more intelligent surveys, both to ask good questions as well as to consolidate the feedback from those surveys and analyze those surveys and feed that into, um, and get that feedback loop going. Uh, that creates a virtuous cycle of data-driven decision making. This has also, AutoML Natural Language has also been helping a lot of uh, customers in the news domain. Hearst newspapers, for instance. Let me tell you a little example about how Hearst uh, used AutoML Natural Language to build their own custom classifier. Um, news organizations typically 
have a large repository of ephemeral content as well as evergreen content. By evergreen content, I mean articles that can be resurfaced over and over again to customers that have a long, these articles have a longer shelf life and they can be fed into recommendation engines. They can be used to personalize and uh, increase the engagement of, of these websites. So Hearst built a custom classifier and again, ephemeral content versus uh, evergreen content. If you were to tag uh, news articles with these two labels, any regular classifier would not have these labels in the first place for you to uh, go ahead and build on top of this. This would require a lot of manual, uh, uh, manual model building process. So within a matter of, um, of, a, of a couple of uh, days or Ours in AutoML NL's case, Hearst was able to load a, um, a, some amount of training data, provide certain articles that were manually picked and tagged by their editors as ephemeral content versus editorial um, evergreen content. And with that custom classifier uh, model that they got, and natural language typically takes about four to five hours uh, based on our internal um, Tests. So after four to five hours of training, uh, of training, the custom classifier model was able to predict with uh, accuracy in in the high 90s whether an article was ephemeral or whether it was evergreen. Now Hearst is able to use that, and they're ready to deploy this model into production uh, to start to build recommendation engines on top of on top of this model. They're also trying to optimize using AutoML NL, uh, the foundation that they've built with the AutoML NL custom classifier model, to Im uh, to improve their ad systems. So that's the power of AutoML natural language. A simple uh, process of building a custom classifier can provide huge cost savings, automate uh, physical processes, and um, enable, enable use cases that weren't possible before. Uh, to quickly summarize, um, if, if there was one key takeaway uh, from this session on both AutoML Natural Language as well as AutoML Translate, high accuracy customization and easy to use machine learning models. The, the, these are the key, um, key value proposition that we would like to, uh, would like to summarize um, the AutoML NL and the AutoML Translate uh, products with. If, if there are any further questions, I'm happy to uh, take any, uh, take Q&A right after uh, the session. We'll be right outside. There's also a couple of t-shirts I would like to give away, but uh, thank you so much for your time today. Um, there are more resources here. Uh, Cloud Translate, uh, the landing pages, there's documentation, there's also some getting started tutorials and uh, quick starts available for your use. Thank you.